So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Matt Kern. Um, he completed his, or he did his uh, Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in University of Copenhagen, and um, did his PhD in University of Toronto, um, and he's also an associate professor from the University of Ottawa, and they, they'll talk us about, talk to us about the East and the uh, evidence of non-genetic causes of the drug resistance. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so um, um, I'm actually a trained chemist. And uh, um, I've been a little bit around. I did my PhD in Toronto, or in Lush Miller, um, looking at chemical pattern formation. How form can arise spontaneously soup of mixed chemicals, which is pretty amazing, pretty awesome to work with. There's concentrated sulfuric acid and stuff. <laughs> oh my, a lot of pills there. Um, and then I moved on uh, to biomedical engineering and started playing with bugs, uh, particularly with the uh, E. coli and with yeast, and, and trying to see <coughs> If some of the ideas that we have about how how regulation works, whether 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 they whether they're true, and, and how do we do that? Well, you can you can you can try to take it apart, but it's so damn complex that you don't really can you can be sure that you fully map the system. Um, so why not build it instead? And now I was what I started doing down in Boston, playing around with DNA assembly different configurations, making different types of transcriptional regulatory networks because that's the, that, that's, that's the easiest thing. And that's what I still do now. But I'm also very interested in looking for um, the lack of control. And, and the, the illustration that I have, on, or the picture I have on, on, on this, uh, a demonstration of this huge variability that, that one can see in this case when you pour a DNA damaging agent on, onto yeast and how very um, seemingly identical yeast uh, tend to respond very differently. If you look very, very closely on this one, you will notice that the ones that actually activate this reporter tend to have a very large blood next to it. Um, and that sort of gives it a way that some of this variability that is seen in this picture has to do with, uh, with uh, some sort of cell cycle dependence in terms of the activation of the various pathways that, that are affected by this drug. Um, this is not a cancer drug, but we have to use cancer drugs to see similar effects. There's a very, very, very broad range of individual cellular responses to, to these drugs. So, one of, one, of my early, one of my first, I suppose, to our explorations was to create these synthetic circuits and then demonstrate, try to control and look for how different modes of control in nuclear gene expression actually affects the heterogeneity of the population. And, and that, that started, um, started around the turn of the century. So, so there's been a lot of work done in this area for the past 10 years. A lot of work on. So we understand things quite well, but not so well in the, in the end. And, and what I'm looking at is trying to understand what is the phenotypic impact of having this highly variable gene expression um, as, is, as exemplified in example, on, on this policy. So before, before I start doing that, and just in particular, I talk about it in the context of. Of, of drug resistance. I'm just going to spend a little bit of time to make sure that, that if you haven't heard about it before, that, that you understand why this is a natural consequence of how cells um, are and what the biochemistry that goes on inside cells. So, the two, <clears throat> at the fun, very fundamental level, if you look at the fund of, uh, in the individual genes and how they're expressed, first of all, there's a very more, small number of molecules. So, so mRNA transcripts are, are very infrequent, sometimes five, some, sometimes six or seven. And it really matters if these mRNAs are, are uh, translated a thousand times, 
It really matters a lot whether you have three mRNAs or four mRNAs. That really gives a lot of difference when you come up at the protein level. And that is a significant source of noise. Um, and it's been documented in all the strong evidence that that is, is, is these small number of fluctuations in the mRNA. Because mRNAs is not expressed, like it comes up one at a time. It's initiated, it finishes, and the time with which it's produced, and you can start translating it, actually occurs fairly randomly. Like, like it occurs with a certain frequency on average, but the interval can vary. Sometimes, sometimes there's a long silent period before new mRNA comes around, sometimes there's a very short. And then what happens as a result of that is we get these burst translational bursts. Suddenly, by chance, there, there, there's three mRNAs floating around, and boom, we get like a huge spike in the translator protein. And then it's followed by a quiescent period where the protein starts degrading or it's diluted out because of cell division and what might not. So, so there's a bursting in translation, and there's also this bursting in actually the, the, the transcription itself. Because DNA encoded regulatory elements changes the dynamics of what takes place on the promoter. And what we looked at, at, at back in the day was, was this idea of transcription reinitiation. Um, so in eukaryotes, it happened quite often that, that, that you get factors. Uh, Tata binding protein is, is one factor that actually sits on the DNA. Once it's bound there, it sticks around. It recurs the, the polymerase. The polymerase initiate transcription throws off a bunch of components that allow it to elongate, but that initial protein still sticks around. That makes it easier for a new RNA polymerase to come in. When it falls off, you have, you have to start it over again. You have, to initiate, you have to call, that event has to occur, and you may then have a, have a long quiescent period. Or think about silencing. You think about silencing, not as permanent, but, 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 but almost always there, and the silence breaks down, the gene becomes active, a short period, it can be transcribed a number of times, and silence is reestablished, and boom, it may take generations because before that window opens up again. So there is this bursting in, in, in both in transcription and translation, and, and, and this is sort of the basic model that's sort of used quite often right now just to illustrate what, 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 what is going on. And, and this is an example where the promoter is, 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 is fluctuates between an active and, 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 and an inactive state. And that fluctuation is really fast. So, so it occurs really, really rapidly. So what we see is essentially just an average of, of that promoter state. And, and the fluctuations, the blue line is, is sort of the deterministic average of what, if you did this many, many times, you would see the blue line. And so these fluctuations here simply comes because you have a very low number of mRNAs that have been translated uh, uh, a number of times, I think it's like 50 times or something from the mRNA on average. And that gives you these, these fluctuations that comes from the underlying fluctuations in the mRNA molecule. Now we start slowing down the promoter kinetics, we'll see that, uh, that, that now we have an additional contribution from these, these bursts. The, the, the period, you have a period where the promoter is in the inactive state, then it will be activated, and it will take some time before it drops back to the inactive state. And if we go to like a very extreme case where we have, <coughs> where, where these two states are very long lived, and this is compared to the protein half life, you can sort of get, get these periods where this, the gene is not expressed, and then boom, it's expressed at very high levels. And that's, that, that's, and, and that's, that's captured by obviously a very simplistic model uh, of what is going, going on. But there's no reason to believe that something any more complex, you will not see the same. <clears throat> and there's a lot of ex experimental evidence for these models. And so, so, so in, in the extreme case, you can get to these, these, uh, these fluctuations where, where, where some cells will express a very high level, other cells will express a very low level, which is sort of a simple and, and mosaic uh, expression pattern that will come from, from uh, for example, from erratic uh, X chromosome inactivation, or some other mechanism uh, associated with mosaicism uh, on, on, a, on a more genetic level. Yes? Uh, how are we measuring number of proteins on the previous slide? Or the the, the, this is, these are simulations, right? Okay. Um, 
uh, it's difficult to count number of proteins the attempts have been made. It's easier to count single mRNAs, and that has been done. And, and, and you know, we actually have, have I, I have not done it, a single lab has done a lot of that, and, and, and some, uh, it's includes in Montreal is, is, is doing this, and they're actually measuring one, two, three, four, five mRNA molecules and, and how that th those fluctuates in, in, in live cells. But, but the proteins levels are a little bit harder to, uh, to quantify without inferring what it, you know, this product. Direct mission is a little bit, it's a little bit tricky. <clears throat> so, and there's a bunch of other stuff, and I don't want to go into the examples, but, but, but it, it's pretty well documented. Chromosomal position is, is an important contributor because that would sort of influence the kinetics of, of, of whether, whether uh, uh, the probability that genes will be activated or, or being a repressed state. And, and it's not just about whether you're in you know, telomeres or this other or the centromeric or the, or the sinus region. There, there, there's, there's a big big influence of histone marks in certain, certain regions and, and influence of gene expression on that. There's a big contribution from the transcription regulatory networks so or the transcription factors that, that help recruit the transcription apparatus. There can be fluctuations in, 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 in those factors and they can change, be variable from one cell to another and they can change over time. There's atriometric cell division. Again, if you have, if you have if you have four mRNAs and, and you have a cell division event where you share uh, shares, uh, cytosolic content, well, sometimes you're going to get four and zero, from, sometimes you're going to get two and two. So, so there is a lot of, lot of variability also coming from that event. And then, of course, there's all the other, other things that we like about cells, the, the age of them, older cells have different properties than young cells, the metabolic state is related to it, cell cycle phase, um, cell type, whatever. That everything will, most things will sort of have an influence and, and can have a manifestation in, 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 in the number of genes that are, or number of proteins that any given cell has. So, <clears throat> you know, one of the advantages of yeast is, uh, is that all these wonderful resources that you can use to do statistics on. It. So, this was a, a paper from Newman, uh, by Newman, that came out eight years ago. And, and what they did was to run two and a half, two and a half thousand or more uh, yeast strains where endogenous protein, protein coding uh, ORFs were attacked with a GFP and they were expressed at the, the native lo lo locus from the native promoter. And they analyzed, they looked at the variance and, and did some trick for normalization and what might not. And, and then they just looked at made two categories of low noise or high noise category classification of, of, of their results and then they did a standard gene ontology enrichment analysis. And there's some, some interesting things that came out of, out of that, for, for example, uh, the genes that contain the Tata box is, is really the most prominent feature that, that will tell you whether, or more, most, most likely thing to demonstrate whether there is a uh, high noise. And that is related to the mechanism where you have this this reinitiation going, going on, uh, which is well described for Tata box containing promoters. Um, uh, another one is, is Saga. I can't really explain that one. I don't I haven't looked into it. And then, but what, what got me really interested was what was stress. Why do stress genes tend to have higher variability in the way they're expressed? And on the other hand, if we look over here, one of the uh, um, essential proteins, genes that encode for essential proteins, are much more narrower in the variation from one cell to another. So we have this essential genes, mm. tightly regulated, stress response genes, seem to be more sloppy when you look at the population. So, <clears throat> and, and, and um, so, so this was after I left, um, uh, this was in 2006, I didn't include them. So, so this was after I left, left the Collins Group in Boston. And, and I worked with, with uh, William Blake on, on, the, on the first part of it. But you have to be independent, so I couldn't collaborate on this one thing. But what, what, what Will did in this study was to introduce uh, mutations into uh, a very common, the yeast gal one promoter. And, and those specific mutations change the properties of the noise. So, so he created one mutant that has 
had this, this very broad and, and, and quite rough population uh, of distribution profile. And he created another one. Uh, well, that was the wild type was the no, he weak in the Tata box. So, so, so the so, so the high noise is the native system, and the low noise is the, is, the, is, the, is the mutated system. Simply by weakening the Tata box, and and then preventing lowering the influence on this uh, reinitiation transcriptional bursting that takes place. And then he had this promoter drive um, um, uh, seosin. Um, a gene that encodes resistance to seosin, and simply looked at what is the fitness when increasing the seosin concentration. And the, uh, if you look at, at, at the high drug concentration, it's very clear that the, the high noise strain has a significant fitness advantage compared to the no drug strain. And sort of the, kind of the opposite happens at low drug dose, where now the low, the low noise mutant has now a fitness advantage compared to the high noise mutant. And <clears throat> this is basically because you have phenotype selection taking place within this, problem, within this system. I say basically because it's not the whole story. But it's the start of the story. Now, we're going to use some very sim simple arguments to explain this. And, 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 and some people that are smarter than me can just grasp the idea and say, oh, yeah, that's got to be correct. I can't do that. I have to sit down and formulate, articulate these ideas in another language, and that's mathematics. And then when I have it in the language of mathematics, then I can convince myself, no way, there's no way I can, this can be wrong because this is the evidence. This is, this is, this is how it works. So, so just for the simple phenotype selection, it, it can start getting a little bit hairy, but if you do it, if you lose your biology, it should be fine because this is Fisher's first theorem all over again in a different form. Anyway, so, so what, what we're interested in, we're interested in population fitness, uh, big W, and we're interested over time, um, and we're interested in, in the correlation of gene expression levels, so let's call that X. And then we introduce this, that, that, that there is the uh, individual cells have a reproductive rate, which is a function of the level of gene expression. It seems feasible enough that, that somehow the level of gene expression gives you small incremental changes to your fitness. It's not all or not, it's a small incremental value. And then we have, finally, we have a probability distribution, which essentially describes your histogram of, of how many cells have, have this level of gene expression. Uh, uh, it's just the likelihood that the given cell would have that like, like gene expression. And so that's the argument that if the, if the population fitness is the integral over the probability of finding at a given level of gene expression at a given time multiplied by the reproductive rate of the cells that, that have that gene expression level. And you, you just average that over the, over the entire population. Now, let me just come up with a, with, with a little bit of a, uh, of, of a simplified picture um, uh, of this. So if you just look at, at, at a scenario where we assume that we have, we have cells that will be viable if they are above a certain threshold. We, we apply a drug, and only cells that express at a very high level will be able to survive. Okay? And that's all or nothing, because otherwise it's a bit complicated. But, but we can make this a smooth curve if we want to. It's not going to change anything. And, and so here we have a fairly narrow, narrow, narrow um, uh, distribution. We have low gene expression, noise in that. And we have a small fraction of those cells that, that will be viable. Now, if you now increase noise, which is sort of broadening the probability distribution function in the, in the interval, well, it will look like this. Now, because we've broadened that distribution, the fraction of the total population that's above that threshold is now increased. <coughs> and obviously, the more viable cells we have, the higher will be fitness at that time point B. So, <coughs> 
It's not the only thing that's required. Right? But the increase in phenotypic diversity within the population essentially gives, gives you something, a substrate on which selection can happen. If you have a very narrow distribution, well, or if you have no variation at all, well, selection can happen. You have nothing to select. Like. The second requirement is that, that somehow there has to be a mechanism to ensure that the cells that are viable when you apply the drug or are viable at time t is, is also viable at t plus 1, and that their offspring is viable at t plus 1 somewhere in some time in the future. And, and, and one mechanism to do that is to introduce mutations. A mutation that, that randomly will make some cells have very, very high expression level will be the perfect mechanism to do that. But it's not the only mechanism. There's many other mechanisms that can actually can, can work, on, work on this level. And that's hypothesis that there are many mechanisms. Theoretically, there should be many mechanisms. And I'll talk, some, some, I'll talk about some of them. Some have, most don't have any experimental foundations. Yeah, but that's something else that we were thinking. Right, it also explains the disadvantage because we just put the put the threshold further down and now suddenly the the, the, the broad distribution will now have a bigger bigger fraction of unviable cells than, than the one with the male. So 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 this 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 variation of, of having below threshold noises at disadvantages above a threshold is advantageous is actually can actually be explained fairly easily. Uh, based on, on, on a fairly simple inter uh, description of the instantaneous fit. And I like to call this acute phenotypic selection because it, it still doesn't capture what takes, goes on in time. Right? This is only at time t that this works. I'll get back to that in, in just a second. All right, so what we need, we need something, uh, a diversity, that allows us for the selection to act, and we need a mechanism to ensure that that's propagated. And there was a very nice example of this exact same idea uh, published in, uh, last year in Science, which talked about this innate growth by stability of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Uh, do, do you have a pointer by chance? So this, this, this work was came out as Terence Walsh lab, who was, who was a physicist and had, had been dwelling about the laws of growth and, um, and, 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 and oh, he calls them growth laws and how bacteria grow and divide and stuff for many, many years. And what, what he was looking at was looking at a very simple, very simple system. And, and I think that everybody can agree that this, this is, must be a simple, but it captures some of reality. So we have Gormphenicol, which is then diffuses into the cell, and Gormphenicol with stunt growth. The impact of stunt growth is that's oh, well. The impact of stunt growth is, is is that the cell can no longer express uh, genes, including a gene that will inactivate Gormphenicol. So, so, that, so that's a fairly, fairly simple. It could, I'm not sure how clonfinical works. Is there a translation on inhibitor? I'm not sure, but it doesn't really matter. It somehow stifles growth, shuts down for, 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 the, for, the, for the ability of, of, the, uh, of the cell to express the genes. What we really have here is, 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 a, uh, is a positive feedback. It's a little hidden. So, um, growth activates cat expression. This activates the removal of a repressor of the growth. So cells that, that, that grow rapidly will have high cat expression, and they will have a high resistance to the clone So based on this simple model, if you start looking at formulate that in equations, and then start looking at the um, uh, changing parameters, you can, you can draw a fitness landscape that, that is not a smooth, smooth surface anymore. 
but, if, but it has to fall. It drifts into itself and then come back up. And that's very characteristic of, of, of what we know from nonlinear dynamics. Uh, is, is, this is the, uh, it's a bistable region where elements could either be in a state, um, in this case here with low cat expression and low fitness, or in a state that's, that has high expression and, and high fitness. And that's all due, that's a hallmark of positive feedback. And, and it's not difficult to appreciate why that happens. If you have, let's say we have positive feedback loop, we have a little bit of, a, of an activator that activates a cell. That means that you just have a little bit of that activator, soon we will produce more activator. And the more we get, the more we will produce, up to some certain saturation. Rate. But if we have none, if there's no, if there's no activator present, none, zero, silt. Well, you're going to just stay there because there's no activator present to activate that positive feedback loop. So it's very, it's very common that, that the positive feedback loops gives rise to this, this ability to have two distinct states of, of a system experiencing exactly the same external signals. And all of you all, what they were able to do was actually to demonstrate that this, this growth by stability is there. Uh, up here, this cell does nothing. Uh, a bacteria that does very little. Down here, there is um, another one that happily divides and produces also. So, and then that's that by stability can simply come from 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 the coupling between between growth and human expression. Some natural consequences. But we still need a couple of things. Like, if we still need noise, if all the cells were in the unfit state, well, they would, they would all be in, they would do nothing. How do we create the diversity where some some cells are in the, in the high fitness state and some are in the low, and that's where the fluctuations become very important because cells that by chance have high gene high cat expression will be able to fall into once the drug is applied, will be able to, to adapt into the high fitness state, while those that have, by chance have very low gene expression when the drug hits will fall down into, into the low fitness state. And once that happens, then the positive kick, kick, uh, feedback kick, kicks in, because, well, grow, growing bacteria, they share a lot, and they, they are, in, inhomogeneous, but, but uh, the likelihood that a mother cell with high cat expression will produce an offspring because you have the fairly symmetric division when you have thousands of molecules swimming around. It's also a very high probability that the daughter cell will now also have a very high cytosolic concentration of this enzyme. And it means that the daughter cell will have a high likelihood of being in the same fit state as the mother because of this positive feedback. They will now, again, produce more cap and you start propagating that phenotypic state from over one generation to another. So this is a really sort of extreme extreme case where where you can think of you can actually we can think about these being let me just push it a little bit and say they're different cell state. Well they're different they you have to say cell types, right? You have, a, you have a fit cell type, you have an unfit cell type. And they're they're marked by this this difference, and that these cell types are stable; they can be maintained quite a long time. Um, uh, I distributed a paper. Um, I was asked to, to send out a paper um, about um, perspective on, on how this works in cancer, and and, and, and I'll get, get get to that in a second. But the, but the author of that, Sui Huang, is very much a proponent for for how positive feedback and differentiation can log in cells, cells in, in, in states that will allow them to stay in that state for, for, for a very long time. <coughs> and, oh, here we go, here we go, right now. So the sui one. And, and in this paper, this was an opinion piece that came out uh, uh, five years ago that actually looked at, 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 at that concluded that I should put a can in. The variability in gene expression can accelerate tumor progression by serving as a temporary substrate for natural selection. 
pretty much alongside the like, same ideas that I, that I just described. The way he advanced it was that, that, that in, within, within a cell population, um, there will be a, a spectrum of, um, of resistant phenotypes. He doesn't really talk about much about what this resistance can come from many different sources. One of them being being fluctuation in gene expression. Uh, for some gene that for some reason confers some drug resistance. It could potentially could give rise to, to, to such a spectrum of, of, of phenotype here, of resistant phenotype. So the idea is that, that once we uh, apply the drug, we initially get this phenotype selection where only, only the cells above a certain threshold will survive. And after that, that will be followed by, by an expansion of these of, 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 of the selected cells. Um, some, of, some of the cells will now have low gene expression. Some of them will be maintained over the, above the threshold. And in this case, when we talk about cancer, one of the ideas is that these initial selections give, give cells a high probability and time to acquire a genetic mutation that will, that will confer a permanent drug resistance. That is then proceeded uh, through genetic selection. I'm not a cancer expert, and I don't know cancer genetics, so I can't really, I can just present what, what he's saying. I can't really, um, I can't really say whether, whether these genetic selections are present in this, in this population or whether it's sort of an acquired genetic mutation that, that comes in. I don't know the frequencies. Does anybody know the frequencies? Does this make sense? Right. Anyway, so, so the idea is, is, is that, that in the, the, the phenotypic variation, variation in resistance will give cells enough time to acquire permanent, permanent uh, resistance. And then he also goes on and talks about, 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 about how that, that, the, that the distribution itself doesn't contain enough information. Because the same, the same sort of profile can come about either with a very fast fluctuation or no fluctuations at all. As if, if the cells just by some mechanism, mutations or whatever, just adapt stable gene expression or slightly different from one cell to So so this makes sense because there's no time information in that. It's a snapshot, it's a picture of this population at that time. But what we really need also is is, is to look at the time scale of, 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 of the, at which these fluctuations take place. And obviously if we have a stable individuality, the, 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 the case of that would be permanent mutation that causes slight variation in the level of expressed proteins. So, <coughs> in physics, we have this statistical mechanics. Um, uh, we have a very common problem, it's is called the mean first passage time. Let's see if we can find another analogy there group of jumping students trying to get to the next bar. But that's essentially the, the, essentially the problem is you have some random process, you have a random drift, and you want to know if, if you start here, you start at A, you want to go to B, how long time does it take on average? Some will get there faster because of random drift, some will make curious excursions. But we're really interested in what is the mean of, of that population. That gives us some idea, and then we can talk about, of course, variation and higher order moments of that distribution. But the first characterization is, is the mean. Now, now, if you go back to the same model as before, we have a distribution uh, of, of, of a gene X with a certain probability. We have a threshold above which uh, cells have the capacity to reproduce. Uh, but they may not be produced. If they don't reproduce, well, there's not, there's nothing's going to happen. It's not, it's not a big, it's not really a big deal. I mean, they would control it. Uh, the only, the only problem is that when they start reproducing. But they can only survive for a certain amount of time, and that is because if you have a random process, you will not have an infinite. It's only when you have genetic mutation that you can talk about something being permanent. Otherwise, the fluctuations will cause cells that are up here initially. They will start meandering around, 
and they will get closer down here because this is the mean. They like to hang out with the mean. They like to be average. So they are actually have, they will naturally drift toward the mean of distribution, and eventually they will hit this threshold, and boom, they will stop. They will die. The drug will kill them, or at least reduce their fitness to zero. So if you look at, at the at the survival time, these are these cells that are at this point will have a certain survival time that is given by, sub, by a certain probability. And that is the time essentially, the survival time is how long will it take for a given cell to hit that back. And it's probabilistic because these are fucked here. Now, there's also an average time for division. But depending on how what the fitness is of, 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 of um, or the, I don't know, this is in, uh, here in this simulation we have uh, time scales is, is one, so division time is one. But they will have some given time, and if cells can survive long enough to divide, it means that they are on the right side of this distribution, well, then you can get into trouble. And actually, if the, if the average time of division coincides with the average time of the survival time, then you'll start seeing it that's where you see the problem arising. If, if they don't survive on average long enough to divide, you'll start to see cells just dying off slowly. If the drug is applied on a constant level. If, if the, on average, the cells on average survive longer than it takes to divide, well, you will start accumulating more and more, more and more cells. You would reproduce faster than you would kill them. And again, that, that, that does change things a little bit um, on the equation. Essentially, the, uh, the fitness is, uh, is replaced by another integral. And now it's the integral from the division time to infinity uh, in this probability up here and, uh, uh, of this probability function, essentially. Yes? So you've used the word survival. And I don't see where in the equation you say whether it's a static drug or a sidal drug. It's all static. It's all static. It's all static. Because it seems like it makes a big difference. It will make a huge if difference. If the threshold, the cell dies, that's very different than just stopping to reproduce. Yes. Uh, so, so, so it's a very idealized case. You have a sharp threshold. When you apply the drug, it will stay at that concentration. And, 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 and you only have two phenotypes. Either your fitness zero or your fitness one. Right? So, so, so one of the things. But there are two kinds of fitness zero. There's dead. And, and, and there's and, 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 and don't. Yes, yes, sure. And, and we don't discriminate between. We actually don't kill them. We, we keep them, but they're going to be they're going to be outcompeted very rapidly. Um, all right. So I'm not going to go into the details, um, um, but but this is essentially the fraction of reproducing cells above the threshold. Uh, this function is that. Uh, the problem is that this, this is a nice model, but it's unsolvable. Uh, uh, the, the, a very simpli simplistic, uh, stochastic model is called the einstein ulmerich process, and it has like, it's, it's, it's a fluctuation that has a, a, about some mean with some amplitude and some time scale. It's the simplest way that you can, you can, you can represent a, one of the simplest ways you can represent uh, a stochastic process. It's just to have mean, amplitude, and time scale. And, uh, and, 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 and it was solved, but only for a special case when the threshold is equal to, to mu uh, or to the mean. And it looks really nasty. It was solved in 1945. And nobody's been done. Well, there's been process, progress. But just to illustrate, this is a really hard problem. So, so we just did a brute force. And so we developed an algorithm to do it instead for us. Leave the other stuff to the theoretical physicists. They laugh at those who call it supplied. Terrible. Anyway, so so we did we did come up with some some exact solution that actually could benchmark the simulation algorithm and, and, it, and it gives some really good uh, uh, consistency between, between experimental uh, or experimental simulation. Sorry, we call it experiments. Simulation, computer experiments. So 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 that's all all spot. So. Now the first thing we then did was to then was to then simulate this the outcome of this now very complicated mess and and, and, and with a very simple stochastic uh, uh, process that just time scale mean and amplitude. 
And um, <coughs> what we have here in black is the original distribution. We just cut it in half because that's where we have some analytic results. So, so we still have to just demonstrate, you know, we have to benchmark it. This is our control because that's where we can get analytic results. And you need to have control of that just like other experiments. But in this case here, the time scale is 0 0.5, which means that the fluctuation is very rapid. And, and uh, the cells, the initial half of the cell population are above the threshold, but that 10 generations later, you see that population starts to drink. And that's the same curve as the uh, Essentially, the fitness uh, rap very rapidly goes to zero, meaning none of these. Uh, and here it's absolute fitness. I'm, I'm trying to anticipate your question. And, and this is actually the fitness here is the number, the absolute fitness, the number of, that's actually been produced within one, one regeneration time. And the net number decreases, of course. Goes to zero. That is that anyway, can we wait till later? <laughs> Good. But if you have, if you have these very, very slow fluctuations, we we'll start seeing we we'll start seeing that the population increases in size, and that um, and it starts to drift. The mean expression level of the population actually dip, drifts because the cells that are closer to the threshold will die off with a higher probability. So this looks actually it looks like induction, and I'm, I'm, I can't really tell the difference. I should show that later. You can't really tell the difference between an active induction event and a drift towards a phenotypic state that has high, high gene expression. Well, it's sort of important if you grind stuff up and interpret that, that, that there must be a mechanism inducing it. No, it's just, it could just be phen phenotype selection. And, and, and okay, so, so here we have different, the different time scale, tau equal to infinity is, is, is a permanent mutation, or, or corresponds to permanent mutation. But we can still get get fairly decent maintenance, and now these populations here, if, if they survive, they will eventually plateau at some level. They are now drug resistant to that drug at that dose. And so looking a little, again, we ask the question, okay, mutations, what is the role of mutations in this? It's just a question about you know, giving cells enough time to, to, to to acquire uh, a, a mutation. So, so what we did something, a little bit of a crazy experiment, and that was we assumed that, that cells could acquire permanent resistance um, at a certain probability per cell division. So I had a 10% probability of doing, uh, getting extremely high mutation rates, or one in a hundred chance of doing it. Um, the, the reason why we did this really, was to show that a tenfold change in mutation rate, if you look at the doubling time of the initial surviving population, the doubling time of the initial surviving population really rapidly converge to a single curve. And at that, single, at that point, which is about tau equal to four, which is, which is, um, which is in, in units of cell division time, tenfold increase in mutation rate has no effect. The populations look exactly similar in, in with respect to um, to the uh, to the drug resistance. Rate. And in this particular simulation, we assumed that we had 100 cells surviving cells. So we are looking, we are waiting until the simulation produces 200 cells, and, and then we that, that's what we call a double time. And there's of course a lot of variation. In it. And this is for this very simplistic model. But we also look at another model that that actually more closely mimics. Um, the burst frequencies that, that we see experimentally in, in mRNA and protein production models. And there, high burst sizes, where burst size is essentially the number of mRNAs that you can produce per, per transcript. And, and when we get up into, into a very high range, we can, we can start seeing similar effects. Mutations don't matter anymore. But of course, this is again with permanent drug conditions and, and a very similar conditions. And it, this was just an example demonstrating demonstrating the correlation. Uh, here we have the lowest level, we have five survivors. If you, if, if you only have five survivors, you really have to have, have fairly long correlation time or time scales of the fluctuation to, uh, in order to, um, 
uh, this is the probability of, of remission. So uh, the um, uh, to have low remission is a bad thing. So fluctuation time scale has to be pretty long. But it can still occur, even, even if you have very, very few survivors. And these are not unrealistic. The time scale of four, is, is, there was a study that looked at fluctuations in, in human healer cell GFP tax and looked at mother-daughter time scales on, 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 on and, it, and the, the time scale is about the range of 1.5 up to, up to 3.8. So, so, so there is, we are in the range that are not under, under this at all. All right, so now back to drug resistance in cancer. So this is a really complicated problem, of course. Uh, there's a whole pharma pharmacokinetics, absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination, and then if you actually get them into cells, then there's inactivation, mutation, drug targets. Uh, there's a, if drug if you pump down the cells and various various other types of, of, of responses that cell can have. Um, so, so this is from a summary, recent summary of drug resistance in, in cancer. And what really, what really, when I looked over this table, I was surprised to see how few cases where we have mutations. So decreased mutation due to mutation of P53, all right, that's a mutation or decreased expression of topolis and RAS2. We can also see decreased expression based on phenotypic selection. It doesn't have to be mutation or tubular mutation. And I think there's another mutation up here. But in most cases, these types of drug resistance may not at, at all be due to mutation. The mechanisms described, increased target expression, could be phenotypic selection. Pathway activation, increased drug influx, could all be due to phenotypic selection, rather than, 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 than permanent mutations. I, I'm not a cancer expert, so, so somebody must challenge me. On this one. But that's what I see in this paper. I see very, very few, most cases, there's not an explicit mention, mentioning of a, uh, of a mutation causing drug resistance. And again, but it's a, it's, a, it's a big mess, so I'll not be surprised if, 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 if there's no one thing and it will not be any one thing. But what I would like to focus on are these influx transporters. Uh, some papers claim that, that, that these efforts transporters are responsible for most cancer resistant uh, drug, drug resistant cancer drug. So humans, humans have 48 of them. It's an ATP binding cassette uh, put, uh, pump that, that really can recognize a lot of structurally very unrelated uh, uh, compounds. Some of them are metabolized. Some are good for the cells. Some are toxins, and it does. They, they don't care. They just pump it out. And they're very indiscriminate, and that's, that's why they're very beneficial when you talk about drug resistance. Because chances are, if you find a drug, one of these guys will probably have it. It's not, it hasn't evolved to any particular structure. I don't know the mechanics of it, because I'm not a structural biologist. I just know that that's what people see. And, and they, can, they can somehow do this stuff. So they have very big tropic effects, and they're highly conserved. You find them in all eukaryotes. And, and probably other organs. And since I, uh, well, so, so this is just a, a, a list of, of, of a number of, uh, long number of, of drugs where, where these, these efforts pump actually have demonstrated to have a, uh, um, have a, a, a cancer, anti cancer drug being a target of, of this trend. What I'm doing, I'm working with yeast, so, so in yeast it's called the Predatory Drug Resistance Network. It's also ABC transporters, there's 16 or so in yeast. And, and 12 of them, two, four, six, eight of them, are, are regulated by these two transcription factors called PDR1 and PDR3. Uh, PDR1 and PDR3 are homologs, so uh, highly conserved homologs. They're very similar to one another. And they're both transcriptional activators. They bind to the same DNA motif, and they either bind as homer, homodimers or, dim or heterodimers. So they can form a complex with another and bind, or they can bind on their own. Now, the uh, this property gives, gives the network some, some very interesting properties 
and, and that these multiple noise and memory components. Uh, first of all, the positive feedback can be a memory model, but by introducing possibility and now getting people getting antsy and real over time. Yes? Should be back in this. Yes, I'm wrapping up. Uh, so one example is that this positive feedback loop, but also this incoherent indirect activation of the pump downstream is also something that can confer the genetic memory uh, uh, to some degree. And it also amplifies noise. The positive feedback loop also amplifies noise. So it's a, there's a lot of interesting topologies about that. And, and if you're interested in that, you have to actually have taken the natural quality and looked at it and, and demonstrated how that transcriptional network in itself can can, can enhance drug resistance, but I'm not going to talk about that. So what we had instead did was to, to put a DFP tag on pdl 5 and look at what happened in the presence of the massive drug, evaluate the survival of, of high and low DFP, uh, PDL, uh, DFP expression, and then determine uh, pdl one impact of pdl one and 3 and sort of the regulatory network opportunity. So what we found was, if we look at, 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 at pdl 5 DFP expression, uh, when, when cells are growing in galactose, we saw, it, saw it, that, that there is this, this subpopulation uh, that have high, um, a high uh, expression of, of this pump. Uh, and add drugs to it, drugs to it, cells switch into that high expression uh, state. They don't go much further, so the median is, is, is approximately the same. So, so, so this is actually a state where, where you have, have the transporter be expressed at, at maximum level, fully induced level, or close to it anyway. So, we asked, where, so what we did was to introduce facts to enrich in, 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 um, the high population in the high expressives and, and low expressives on sorted. Uh, after the facts just painted them, uh, read up without drugs. And it's sort of very clear here that the, that the high expression subpopulation has a clear growth advantage where in, in the presence of the drug, whereas the low, low expression subpopulation does not. But, but it's, it's, it can't really grow very well on, on, uh, on drug data. It's also a bit, little bit of indication over here that maybe there is a, in the absence of the drug, there's a disadvantage. Uh, but it's hard to see because the enrichment here is not very good. Uh, instead, what we did, combine facts in which with drug pre-treatment, so now we induce cells and select for these high expressors, so we get a, get a, get a cleaner sample uh, of the high inducing. And here it's very clear, low expressing cells with the drugs, they're basically dead, dead in the water. And, 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 and without the drugs, they may be a little bit clumsy, these ones we, we do, we do, but it's very clear there is a fitness, the high expressors actually have a fitness disadvantage. And this is, this has in the literature, it's, it's, it's a bedheading strategy, uh, a social bedheading strategy. You, you, you sacrifice part of your population to try, yes, I know. No, no, I'm just wondering, are you sure you haven't got any genetic mutations? The aneuploidy is sort of one in 10 to the minus five. Yeah, so it's well, not so, hard to get. So, so here, this is the enrichment with the facts. So we get about 50-50, we go from 90, 90 to 1%, and then the, we recover over time, it will drift back to the original populations. And, and the same thing happens when we bridge, um, we do it um, with drug pretreatment, where we get a much cleaner population. And it sort of relaxes back on similar time scale um, uh, in, in the two cases. So these populations are, are in fact dynamically maintained. And we turn over to look at, okay, what does PRPR3 do? Uh, in, in the wild type population, we have about 1%. The leading PDR1 actually surprisingly increased at 2.54, so increased that high subpopulation. So that's when PDR1 is actually a repressor of, 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 of cells in this state. And then uh, when we got rid of PDR, PDR, PDR3, we went and approximately decreased it by, by tenfold. So this could in itself indicate that, that, that PDR1 acts to attenuate the number of cells that are in a high cell population, which could sort of work as a control switch to how, how many, what fraction of the population cell am I going to sacrifice in order, in order to, 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 to maintain that high expressive state. So this is the effect of the PDR1 deletion. 
um, uh, as, be as before. The, uh, what did I want to say with this? Uh, nothing really. Look, looks the same as before. And, and, and again, we do some, we do some compare it to, to the wild to the nation, to the, to the wild type just to figure out what's going on. Because we were very surprised that it's supposed to be an activator, but, but, but uh, uh, it seems that when we delete it, the induction is decelerated, and, and, and we actually attain higher levels of gene expression than high software production. And it's sort of inconsistent with, with the idea of how this network was supposed to work, but I guess that's the surprises of doing novel experiments. So the pdr one actually accelerates the recovery if you have drug enrichment and, and then and, and try to uh, that's in the mutant, if you, without the pdr 3 these high expression subpopulations is maintained for a very long time. The student was not happy about that. You have to go in these intervals and run it up the fast. So pdr one actually uh, uh, accelerates the loss of, drug, of, 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 of this high drug resistance. And, and PDR, PDR3 has the opposite effect. If you get rid of PDR3, the induction of PDR5 is very weak, which means indicates PDR3 is essential for maintaining, for getting that, that, uh, uh, that high induction. And it recovers very rapidly to, 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 to pre, uh, pre duck condition uh, when, when, uh, when, when it's gone. So there's, there's this two opposing things. PDR3 enhances the drug system, PDR1. Uh, Attenuates the drug system. Now, the other question we then ask: Okay, does it have something to do with the with the if we went to the PDR one, PDR or PDR three, we really disrupt the network a lot. So we wanted to know: Can we, it, does the coherent feed forward loop actually have a significant role? So we reconstituted it relying on the fact that there are high homologs. But in the case of we only had two copies of PDR three, one in the PDR one position. Oh God. I'll insert a PDR1 in the PDR3's position. The network topology should be the same because they are so highly homolog. And it turns, so we reconstituted it's the same state in deletion mute and introducing the network connectivities of the original uh, uh, system, but without the addition. And it didn't seem to have much of an effect. So this is, this is a wild type induction uh, when we have two PDR1 um, and instead of PDR3, it's hard to induce it. And it looks very much like PDR3 deletion. Can you tell the difference? So inserting PDR1 to recapture that, uh, that possibly the, uh, the network architecture doesn't do anything, really. And the same for the, when we reinsert, take, take the PDR1 deletion, we insert PDR3 in its place, nothing really happened. So, so there's really no evidence for that, that the feed forward group um, plays a significant role in this. So, 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 we believe that it's probably because of this positive feedback loop with PDR3 activating itself and that these states can be maintained for a very long time. But we don't have any conclusive evidence to, to, um, to support that. So the conclusion is yes, in the title of my talk. This is sort of the evidence that's there, out there right now, in terms of. of the non-genetic causes of, of drug resistance. And I I'm, I'm hope you're convinced that there might be something to it. Um, and, but we still don't know whether it's relevant to the clinical samples, which is answering this interest in this, not the other guys. Um, and then uh, the acknowledgement, so it's just one of this, um, the Garber's collaborator, Stony Brook, my physics uh, PhD student, Daniel, did all the simulations and Physics paperwork that he's now at Sony Group as a postdoc. Afton did all the experiments. He's now at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Dawn is a programmer who's now a startup in, in Texas, a hardcore programmer, forecasting stuff. And Ian Gulman, who is uh, who's, who's currently who's still in my lab. Touch on something you mentioned more closer to the beginning of the talk. With all the sources of 
variation or noise yes. further beyond the, the level of uh, RNA expression before you get to process. Does that make sense to study uh, the transcriptome to, uh, to try to understand the level of uh, protein expression? Or uh, would, you, would you argue in what quality? Well, if you do single cells transcript analysis, yeah. If you, if you grind up a lot of cells, you, you will always average out any differences that you might have. And, 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 and yeah, it depends on, on if, you, if, you, if you're interested in astrocytes, you have these criteria to define what an astrocyte is, well, you should just be fine. But if you then discover in two years that there is another market that actually differentiates astrocytes A from astrocytes B, then, well, you have to do the experiment again. You can only investigate to magnification that's available. And all this is available. Does that make, make sense? Oh, we can talk about it more later. Okay. Um, so how big is this effect compared to, for example, the cell actually uh, responding to a drug and increasing the transcription actively versus or more than likely versus it's just kind of selection? And this, okay. this particular network is really interesting. Because it has been known, the network architecture has been known since the 80s. Yeah. And, and these response elements are some of the first things because drug resistance is so important and so highly concerned um, that, that it's been very thoroughly active in study. Nobody knows what the induction mechanism is. It seems to be associated with mitochondrial DNA and mitochondrial function, somehow activating PDR3, but it's not really known. Others say that, that it's loss of membrane integrity that activates somehow uh, PDL1, but the mechanisms are not known. Which is sort of interesting. Maybe there is no mechanism. Maybe it's just for YouTube selection. I don't know. Well, yeah, that's what I was asking. Like, do you know the different, like let's say you have an example where you know for sure it's just going to do selection. You have an example where it's a mechanism. Like, what would be the order of magnitude of change over time? Like, like let's say you're, you're doing an experiment and see the transcription response over time. Would, most of the changes be because of this or because the cell is actually increasing the transcription? Now, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, there is a time scale difference in population dynamics and transcriptional induction. And like in yeast, it takes about 20 minutes in order to see, from strong promoters, to see, um, to, to see transcripts by what, what fluorescent. Uh, you could probably do it with mRNA and then we see it much faster. Uh, but the population selection is much slower because that's a time scale of cell division time, which is 90 minutes. So, so, so you can probably tell based on time scale. And I would bet that, there, that you can't, in most cases, why use one mechanism when you have two? Like, you know, obviously, cells that are induced already will have a growth advantage over cells that are not induced. And if they can then propagate that induction to offspring, well, why not? Then you have a combination of induction and phenotypic selection. And, and I, I, I just don't see why. Maybe we can create it synthetically, but, 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 but I think cells try to make it as messy for us as possible. But that's my experience. Probably two more questions, and then we can uh, go with the beverages. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, the, um, like the, the noise that you see, like that actually postulate your model to exist across the population of cells. Do you think that affects each gene in the same way? Or do you think there's like a, do you think, let's say, high, high expressing cells means high expressing for all the genes or just for, you know, a few genes and that, that the noise for the given gene is important with other genes? It's highly correlated. Um, um, they're, they're like, there's a high correlation between functional related genes in their fluctuations. But what about like uh, all genes as a group? Like, would you expect that the total RNA output would be higher in the high expressing cells, or you wouldn't be able to see that? Uh, oh, you mean you mean in this particular PDR5? We, we, yeah, we, we haven't done the experiments yet. I'm just, I'm just asking in terms of what you think in terms of your model. Do you, you think you see, uh, you know, there's a variation in uh, gene expression? It, it, it's, it's possible that, 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 that it, it reflects a different metabolic state. It, it's, it's possible. It's possible that this is linked to a switch from anaerobic to aerobic uh, um, um, 
metabolism, actually, which also involves the mitochondria. So, so, so there are there are certain ways that that, that this could be explained um, without necessarily invoking uh, single molecule fluctuations. Uh, it is also possible that 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 that, that subpopulation have other genes that are highly expressed. So if I put if I put say any random promoter and introduce it into this, will, will, it, will that also be high in that subpopulation? Uh, I don't know. We haven't, we haven't done the experiment. But but what we will do is we will sort these and do some qPCR in it, and then see whether we should see whether our controls are our controls and, and, and keep constant. Two populations, similar to population. Yeah, but it could be like a mechanism that's responsible for variations consistently affecting the entire transcript as opposed to uh, yeah, and, one, and one example is the cell cycle. Oh. Right. So, so, so where you have uh, many of the genes are cell cycle yeast, many of the genes are cell cycle regulated. So some of the variation from one cell to another will be driven, and, and as a group, all the cell cycle regulated genes will, will be in phase or, or phase shift, depending on, on what transcription factors are involved. Yeah, so, 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 so there are a lot of correlations between, between uh, that's one example. But there's also examples if you have this, genes that are regulated by the same shared pathways, if the noise is propagated from some upstream thing or upstream feedback that's activated in some cells, not in the other, you would also see that that, that manifests in entire groups of cells. Uh, of, and, all operon expression is probably the same. Some some cells in operon and the whole cluster of genes are expressed in others is not. So there, so there is high level coordination, absolutely. Cell age is another certain things are like other other things that come right away. It's the cell age. One more question, but I'll save it for the oh. <laughs> great. Well let's thank both. Thank you for coming <laughs> on. Sorry for